This content is not suitable for children and may contain depictions of violence. Hi, I'm your host Cambo. Grab a beer, pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island. Everybody knows it's another true crime podcast. So, hi Islanders, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. I know a lot of you are in ISO, but a big shout out to those not only in the medical profession, but all of those out there that are working hard to keep things going in these trying times. Now, I'm almost out of ISO, but no my luck, they're going to lock the place down next week, so I really need to get out of here before I start calling the cat Wilson. So tonight's case is in fact another case I saw in forensic files while cooped up here. It's about Jeffrey Gorton, who really did think he was smarter than the cops, but would get end up getting caught out by his own perversions. Now references tonight are from The Gazette, The Courier, The Des Moines Register, The Tennessean, the Detroit Free Press, the Livington County Daily Press and Argus, the Orlando Sentinel, prabook.com and inquisitor.com, not to mention the forensic files. And I did get a photo off already gone from Nina, but a bit more on that later. So tonight we go back all the way to 1986 to Flint, Michigan. Here, Margaret Eby, 55, lived in the gatehouse on the Applewood Estate. Margaret Eby, nee Fink, was born on February the 8th, 1931 in Detroit, Michigan, USA. Daughter of Christian Gotthilf and Martha Frieda Fink. She was a student at Wheaton College, Illinois, 1947 to 49. She did a Bachelor of Arts at Wayne State University in 1955 a Master of Arts at Wayne State University 1962, a Doctor of Philosophy at University of Michigan in 1971. Now, she had a vast career, many positions, but in 1986, she was the Professor and Provost at the University of Michigan, Flint. She married Stuart Leon Eby, August the 25th, 1950. She had four kids, Dale, Mark, Jonathan and Margaret. Now, late in the evening on November the 7th, 1986, Margaret returned to the gatehouse at Applewood Estate after a dinner party. Two friends accompanied her to the gatehouse door and waited until she was safely inside before departing. The gatehouse is situated away from the main house where Ruth Rawlings Mott lived. And not to take anything away from Ruth's achievements, but she was married to the co-founder of General Motors, General Motors, I was about to say General Motors Holden, but General Motors, Charles Stewart Mott. The gatehouse was a two-storey building which had previously housed staff such as gardeners and such over the years. When Margaret didn't show for an engagement with her friends on the 9th, they were worried and so they went to see her at around 4.30pm. They were shocked to find she'd been brutally murdered. Police arrived and found Margaret on her bed with her hands bound with twine. She'd been stabbed several times and her throat had been cut to nearly the point of decapitation. Although it wasn't reported at the time, she'd been raped as well. There was no sign of forced entry, which indicated either Margaret knew her assailant or she hadn't locked her doors when she got home. Now, I don't think she left the doors unlocked because in January 1985, Margaret complained to Mrs. Ruth Mott, the owner, about break-ins she experienced at the gatehouse, including an incident on January the 23rd, 1985, during which Margaret's compact disc player and purse were stolen. Margaret requested that a security alarm system should be installed Ruth Mott just got new deadbolt locks fitted. Now, no alarm system was ever installed. 
So if you see the size of this Applewood estate and the wealth of the owners or owner as Charles was dead at this stage, the installation of a proper alarm system wouldn't have broken the bank. For some people, they're just, just tight and stingy. Anyway, I reckon Margaret would have locked up this place for sure. Now, the forensic files, they said that the windows of the buildings, well, of this building, didn't have any curtains. Now, I don't know how true this is. The gatehouse is protected from prying eyes to a certain extent by the shrubbery surrounding the property line. Anyway, investigators found very little evidence, but they did have a semen sample and a partial fingerprint from one of the taps in Margaret's bathroom. No murder weapon was found. Back in the day, and this is 1986, the fingerprint database was not linked to other states and there was no match in the system. Now DNA, that was around, but it was really in its infancy and was rarely used in Michigan at the time as it was also extremely expensive. Margaret was well liked in the community and had no enemies and her estranged husband was cleared of any involvement in her murder. Sadly, with no leads and very, very little evidence, the case went cold. Now we go to the 17th of February 1991, where Northwest Airlines flight attendant, 41-year-old Nancy Jean Ludwig, was checking into the airport Hilton Inn near the Detroit Metropolitan Airport. Nancy was married to Art Ludwig, who was a retired vice president and program director of a local TV station. They'd met when she was, she'd worked as a secretary at that station. Nancy had always wanted to be a flight attendant and had been working her dream job for Northwest Airlines since 1976. Her flight from Las Vegas got in around 7.51 p.m. and from what I can see, she was an extra crew member or add-on rather than with a common crew. So when she left the airport to go to her hotel room, she did with only one other crew member on a shuttle bus. The check-in procedure at the Hilton for flight crew, that was pretty relaxed. There were keys with names on them and a list for the flight crew to sign on at the front desk. Anyone could see who was in what room and who had already checked in. Now it's not very secure, but that day they'd had 185 Northwest employees either check into or out of the hotel. So I suppose it just became the way they did it. When Nancy didn't answer her automated wake up calls and failed to make her morning flight out, she wasn't missed at first because as I said, she was an add on and not with a common flight crew. Hotel staff would try to contact Nancy around midday and when they didn't get an answer, they opened the room and they found Nancy, her leg hanging out from the blankets. She was dead. When law enforcement officials arrived, they found the body of Nancy lying face down in a pool of blood. She was bound and gagged. She appeared to have been dead for hours. And strangely, they found that all of her belongings had vanished including her burgundy flight luggage from Northwest Airlines, her clothes, the bin liner, and her Northwest Airlines uniform. An autopsy report later confirmed that Nancy Jean Ludwig had been raped and her throat was cut. She'd suffered defensive wounds and it looked like she'd rigorously tried to fight her attacker off. Again, there's no forced entry into this room so Nancy may have known her killer. It looked like the killer spent a lot of time in the room. He wasn't rushed. He'd showered, dressed, and when he left, he put the do not disturb sign on the door. There was a bloodied towel in the bathroom, but no fingerprints. The fellow flight crew member she'd checked in with told police they'd noticed a strange guy on the airport shuttle on their way to the hotel. She said he had no luggage and sat next to Nancy and was sometimes staring at her during the short trip. He got off at the hotel with them and when they turned to get their luggage, he was gone. They then went into the hotel reception, picked up their keys 
They both went to the third floor where their rooms were. And now Nancy's room was up, up the corridor and around the corner. It was out of sight of the first crew member's room. Now this room number was 354 at the end of the hallway. The flight attendant was able to give police a description of the man. He was white, he had dark brown hair, a weathered face, average build, and maybe 45 years old. Another flight attendant had noticed a similar man in the hallway earlier that day, and he'd run off down the fire stairs when she saw him. Also, another witness noticed a man putting Northwest Airlines type luggage, the type the flight crew use, into the back of a late model 1978 to 80 Chevy Monte Carlo sedan. It was brown or bronze with a white number plate. Now, for the Aussies out there, a Monte Carlo is a car, not a biggie. The witness described the guy similarly to the other flight attendant, but he described him as maybe a bit younger. As all of Nancy's belongings, including her flight luggage, was missing, police wanted to talk to this guy with the Monte Carlo. Now, <laughs> there was 2,800 Monte Carlos registered that fitted this description. So they had to track down every one of them to interview. Every one of the owners, not the cars. They also had to find everyone that had checked in and flown into the area that day and had checked out of this hotel and left the area the day after the murders. So that's not only people from the hotel, this is people from the airport. Anyway, anyone who had access to the hotel, such as staff or anyone doing maintenance or deliveries, this added up to about 20,000 people they had to clear. Now that's quite a lot when you only have rudimentary computers at your disposal. Now, Aunt Ludwig, he used his connections in, in TV to publicise this case. There was a $50,000 and then an $80,000 reward uh, for any information to sort this crime out. However, the case ended up going cold. DNA from the swab taken from Nancy didn't show up in any DNA database. So 10 years later, in 2002, luck would have it that the son of Margaret Eby saw the details of Nancy's murder on TV and contacted Art Ludwig, telling him that Nancy's murder was similar to his mother's murders, murder 15 years before. Now Art contacted police and they were able to then do a DNA test on the semen sample taken from Margaret and it matched to the one taken from Nancy. So police knew it was the same person, but still, that DNA match didn't match anything that existed in the database. They decided to look again at the evidence in the Margaret Eby case, and they found the tap with that fingerprint. Now, back in 1986, it was put through the Michigan fingerprint database, and there was no match. But now, they had a national database, and they ran the fingerprint through again. And guess what? They got a match. Wow. It was 39-year-old Vienna Township resident Jeffrey Wayne Gordon. Vienna Township in Michigan, it's just up the road from Applewood Estate where Margaret Eby had been murdered. Now, Gordon's fingerprints were in the database from serving time for assaults on women in Florida. He had a history of violence against women and his felony convictions in Florida involved physical assaults on women. One tack in 1983 in Florida, he ripped the undies off a woman and then ran off. He also had a panty fetish where he would steal women's underpants. He was arrested for disorderly conduct for lifting and looking up a woman's skirt in a Flint area drugstore. Now in order to prove Gordon was the killer, they had to get a DNA sample. Police followed him to a skating rink where he was eating with his kids. Now when he finished, they were able to get a styrofoam cup he'd been using. Now, for those in the future, styrofoam is this awful, toxic shit we used to make cups out of and drink, drink from. That we probably still do in a lot of places, but thank God that's disappearing out of the environment. Anyway, the cup ended up having a mixture of DNA when they tested it. 
However, the results showed that it was probably Gorton whose DNA sample was found at both the murder scenes and that was enough for police to get a search warrant of his house. Police arrested Gorton and a search of his home, now get this, search of his home found 800 pairs of women's underwear labelled with dates, places, some with names on them. Now this is real Russell Williams sort of shit. There was also a video of him wearing the underwear, just like Russell Williams did. Now I'm not kink shaming, I don't care what type of undies you want to wear, or even if you want to go commando, that's up to you. When they're stolen undies, and you get off on wearing them, well that's perverted, especially when you rape, or murder someone, attack them, or whatever, to get off on your fetish. Now, they took a formal DNA sample. Now, this was a match to the samples taken from Margaret and Nancy. When he was arrested, he tried to say that his semen was found in Margaret because he was having a sexual relationship with her and that the real killer was someone known to him. Now, he had worked, this is Gorton, had worked at the Applewood Estate servicing the sprinkler system when he worked for his parents Shirley and Lawrence Gorton. Now they owned the Buckler Automatic Lawn Sprinkler Company. While doing a six monthly service near the gatehouse that Margaret lived, he left the outside basement access doors unlocked. He was then able to enter the building at a later time and wait for Margaret to come home. Now when her friends did the right thing, they dropped her off and made sure she got in the house, well he was waiting for her and he attacked her. He bound and gagged her, raped her, then stabbed her to death. He was then able to clean up, steal some of her undies and then leave. However, he left that partial fingerprint on her bathroom tap. Now with Nancy's murder, it looked like either he saw her at the airport or was loitering around the hotel. Now, look, he knew that flight crews would be checking in and out all the time. As I said before, their names were open for all to see at the front desk, including their room numbers. He seems to have waited in the stairwell for the flight attendant that was going to use room 354 because it was at the far end of the hallway out of sight. When Nancy opened her room, he rushed out and forced his way through the doorway. He then attacked Nancy with a knife while she tried in vain to defend herself. She was ultimately overpowered, gagged, wrist bound with twine, which by the way, this twine was used by Gorton as part of his job doing the sprinklers. Well then he raped and murdered her. He then took all her jewellery, her rings and earrings, he actually took her earrings and rings off her body. He took her luggage because he knew there'd be something in there for his fetish like her undies or other clothing in it. He stripped her naked as well, taking her uniform. He even took the bin liner, which he may have used to put his bloodied clothes into. Gorton raped Nancy's lifeless corpse again, then he showered, got changed, put the do not disturb sign on the door and casually walked out of the hotel. He was seen by that other witness, putting that Northwest Airlines luggage into his Monte Carlo. Funny enough, he still had that car when police arrested him more than 10 years later. Gordon would go to trial for Nancy's murder and plead not guilty. He would be found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. In Margaret's case, he would plead not guilty to two counts of first degree murder, one for premeditated murder and one for murder while in commission of a felony and a single count of first degree criminal sexual conduct. Eventually he would plead no contest and get this to save his family the shame of a trial. My god, what the fuck. Anyway, he was sentenced to 40 to 80 years in prison on September the 19th, 2002 and then sentenced to life in prison on February the 13th, 2003. Now, I know the justice system in the US can be fucked up sometimes, just like virtually every country, Australia, UK, you name it. But you guys, when you want to lock someone up, you, you know how to lock them up. How Gordon's wife didn't know about all the undies he'd stolen. 
There were bags and bags and boxes of them. Look, I, I don't know, but I, I, look, I don't want to put any of this on her. She and her family would be going through enough shit as it is, not to mention the Ludwigs and the Evies. Art Ludwig said he'd killed, Gorton this is, had killed two people the day he killed his wife. He very much loved her, but he never gave up on getting justice for her, just like Margaret's son and even the police. They never gave up on this case. They just waited for technology to catch up. And, you know, if he could have kept his hands to himself, this Gorton prick, not been such a fucker, beating up women and stealing their undies, he almost could have gotten away with these murders. So what do you reckon, Islanders? This guy was just looked like the normal guy next door with his family and kids, but he had this dark side, stealing ladies' panties and slips, not just from their homes. He would attack them on the street for his fetish. He even murdered two innocent women, and he nearly got away with it. 16 years it took for the justice system to send him on the karma bus. Boom fuckalunga that they did. A big shout out to Nina Instead, who is the host and creator of the Already Gone podcast. Check it out if you haven't listened before. She does a lot of cases from the Michigan area. She's done this case as well. So please comment as you see fit down below. Go to my website, whose link is in the description, and that will have all this social media, iTunes link, merch, and all this sort of stuff. I do have a new red bubble shop to go with the threadless one. And also, there's links to the audio version of the podcast. I have over a hundred other cases on there, and I'm going to re reboot a few very soon into video format. So that's it for tonight. Stay safe, people. I've been your host, Cambo. Good night, and as I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. Boom, bugger,